Good morning. You guys made it out on a Sunday rainy day. I'm so glad that you're here. Those of you watching online, glad you're here as well, unless you ought to be here. Um, but uh, did y'all have a good week? Yeah. Anybody get sick this week? I, I tell you, we, they have once a year, there's this, it's like a family conference. And it, it's really good for uh, pastors like in their families. And this year, normally it's in South Florida, but this year it was in Phoenix. So last Sunday, after all the services, we jumped on a plane to fly to Phoenix. And when I got there, I was just sick. I had this like sinus pressure thing going on. So I missed Monday, the whole day of the conference on Monday. But I was feeling better on Tuesday. We get up to go down and, you know, get some coffee because you got to have, got to have some Starbucks to get started. And Luna, you know, she looks up at me and she's got the stomach virus. Now, our first thought is like, well, she's little. She ate something last night, you know, on the plane. It was late. And so she's probably a fine. Everything's probably okay. <laughs> but then we just started dropping like flies, okay? You know, Tyler at the store, he threw up all over everything. That was gross. I just walked away like I didn't know him. <laughs> and so we all just kind of start to get... You know, we start to get sick. Everybody except for Stephanie, Larry, and Amber. Anybody without Grambling DNA did not get sick, all right? <laughs> Until the last day, and then Amber got sick, and actually they're still waiting to, uh, to come back. But I'm sitting in there in the conference on Tuesday, because I, I made it to Tuesday. Then I got the virus, and so I, I struggled with that the rest of the week. It was... Just a trip um, that made you look forward to heaven. But I, I was sitting there and I was listening and this guy was preaching and I thought, wow, this is really good. I need to kind of look into this and then uh, talk about it. Maybe, you know, on the weekend or the staff or something. And then when I got the stomach virus, I thought, you know what? This weekend would be a great weekend to uh, talk a little bit about what uh, he had to say. So that's kind of what I did um, on the plane. And you know, we're in this series where we've been kind of talking about the things you talk about on the front porch over some sweet tea in the midst of summer. And kind of our foundational verse has been Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. So let me read it to you. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are awesome things when you think about actually experiencing them. And, and I want us to talk about faithfulness. That's what I want us to talk about because, you know, over the years, Potential is not necessarily an easy church to be a part of. And the reason is because every time you're here, you're going to get challenged, hopefully encouraged, inspired, but challenged to to reach your destiny, to be everything that God's created you to be, to not settle for anything, anything less, to continue to move towards um, what God had in mind before he knit you together. And I thought, well, what happens if you pursue it? I don't want to just try to inspire or challenge or encourage or even kick you in the rear towards your destiny or your potential. What, what are some things that happen if you try to, to reach out for it? Well, when it comes to the idea of faithfulness, I thought, well, first of all, faithfulness can produce results. I've seen it in my own life. My mom was faithful to take me and my two brothers to church. Now, my dad didn't go, and my dad always had other temptations. He'd be like, let's go fishing. Let's go to the movie. All of these kind of things. And then me and my two brothers would be, yeah, let's go with dad. And mom would be like, no, no, we're going to go to church. And she took me to church. And she took me to what we called back in the day, vacation Bible school. It's kind of like our children's camp. And that's why I just want to remind you, parents, of the importance of faithfulness when it comes to something as easy to miss as children's camp. 
Because it's easy in our minds to think, well, there's next year, there's the next day, there's the next, right? But you never know. My mom was faithful. She was faithful to take us day in and day out, year in and year out, until one night we were at a revival. And I don't know if you know what that is, but it's basically where you come to church every night for a full week. Can you imagine that? You know, we, we don't come four weekends in a row, let alone four nights in a row. But back in the day, and my mom brought me, and I was sitting there in a metal chair as a young child, and for the first time in my life, I felt lost. I had heard preachers preach. I had been to children's camp. I had been to, the, to um, all the different things that my mom took me to. But on this night, it wasn't the, the preacher. It was my mom's faithfulness in the Holy Spirit that radically changed my heart and my life. And anybody that I've impacted is a result of my mom's faithfulness. It produces results. And here's the good news. Anybody can be faithful. Not just special people or good people. Anybody can be faithful. So one of the benefits of the fruit of the Spirit, of living out that faithfulness, is it produces results in our lives. Real results. Real impact. Real change. But I also know that the moment you decide that you're going to be faithful, one of the most difficult things to be faithful through is criticism. Is the moment you decide that you're going to do something with the life that God's given you, there are always going to be others. I, I kind of call them rocking chair critics because it doesn't take a lot of energy to tell me what you're doing wrong. We do it to coaches. We do it to pastors. We do it to teachers. We do it to spouses. We do it to parents. Critics, how do you deal with criticism? How do you be faithful when the world we live in, especially today, is so critical. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever experienced any kind of criticism in your life? Let me see your hand. All right, so that's the vast majority of us. So I want us to look at a story, and the story's found in the Old Testament. And I want us to look at the critic and the criticized. We're going to look at both sides of this, because at times we are the criticized, and at times, sadly, we are the critics. And we're going to look at David. King David. Maybe you've heard of him before. And at this point in his life, David is once again incredibly discouraged. Because if you remember the story, the first king was Saul. And Saul screwed up. And God said, we're, we're going to get a new one. And he chose David. But David didn't immediately go to the throne. And so Saul was jealous of David. And he's trying to kill David. And he runs after David. And David has tons of attempts or opportunities to, to kill Saul, but he never takes advantage of any of those. Until eventually, Saul and his son Jonathan, who just happened to be David's best friend, end up, well, they end up being killed by the Philistines in a battle. And when they do, David then becomes king. He's on his throne. He has incredible victories. You remember when he was a kid, he beat Goliath. And he takes Israel and, uh, to becoming a, a great nation, well-known around other nations. Lots of success. But in the story we're going to read, David's at a point in his life where, well, things are going the other way. He screwed up with a famous story maybe you've heard just a couple of years before the story we're going to read with Bathsheba. Kind of blew that. And then, because he didn't deal with a family issue the way one of his boys wanted him to, Absalom, he decides to rebel against his father. And it's not just like, I'm going to do what I want to do, and he runs to his room and he slams the door. Absalom actually decides he's going to overthrow his father. He's going to take over the throne. He's going to be the man in control. And so David, in fear of losing his life, is leaving Jerusalem. And you can imagine the emotion that he's feeling. He's being chased out of his own palace. 
He feels like an incredible failure. He hasn't even been able to lead his own family. And so he's got his head down. And he and some of his boys are, are leaving, looking for a place to hide. And up on the hill beside, there's another guy. His name is Shimei. And Shimei is a part of Saul's family. And you can imagine he's a little frustrated with David because Shimei has lost everything. At one time, he had access to the palace. He was somebody. He was related to the king. He had power. He had influence. He had money. But now that David has been ruling for years, he has none of that. It's been 25 years since Saul died. He blames David because if you know the story, there was a time when David was hiding from Saul that he at least tried to hide among the Philistines. And so the rumor is, is that David actually sided with the Philistines to take out Saul and Jonathan so he himself could become king. And so Shimei is standing there on the hill and he has blamed David for everything that has ever gone wrong in his life for the last 25 years. And as David leaves town with his head down, discouraged, defeated, depressed, Shimei stands up on the hill and he mocks him and he throws rocks at him. And I want us to pick up the story there in 2 Samuel chapter 16. It says, as King David came to Behirim, a man came out of the village cursing them. It was Shimei, the son of Gera, from the same clan of Saul's family. So he's a part of Saul's family. And he threw stones at the king and the king's officers and all the mighty warriors who surrounded him. Get out of here, you murderers, you scoundrel. He shouted at David, the Lord is paying you back. You're just getting what you deserve, David, for all the bloodshed, for what you did to Saul and what you did to Jonathan. You deserve this. You stole his throne. And now the Lord has given it, the throne, to your son Absalom. Last, you're going to taste your own medicine, David, for you are a murderer. And so all of this criticism is being thrown down at David. He's throwing rocks at David. Well, the guys that are with David, how do you think they're going to respond? Look at, look at what it says in verse 9. <laughs> One of his dudes say, Why should this Shimei, this dead dog, curse my lord the king? He says, Let me go over and cut off his head. You ever want to do that to your critics? That in-law that just keeps criticizing your cooking? Or the way you raise your kids? Or the person at work where you're just never good enough, you never do enough, right? They're like, David, just let me go cut his head off and we won't have to worry about it anymore. He'll just be gone. And I think at times we're all tempted to overreact to our critics and to make things actually worse as opposed to better. But look at what David says in verse 10. He says, no. <laughs> and I love this. He said, well, who asked for your opinion anyways? If the Lord has told him to curse me, then... Why should we stop him? And in that, don't you see, can you just feel David's sense of failure? Because see, just two years before this, Shimei doesn't know this, but everything Shimei is saying isn't true about the circumstances in which he's saying them. But the fact that David is a murderer, that's true. Because he took out Bathsheba's husband. So David's feeling the guilt of all the bad decisions he's made. And he says, why, why, sh why, should, why should we stop him? And then David said, my own son's trying to kill me. Doesn't this relative of Saul have even more reason to do so? Leave him alone and let him curse. The Lord has told him to do it. And perhaps the Lord will see that I'm being wrong, that what he's saying about me is not true. I didn't kill Saul. I didn't kill Jonathan. I didn't steal the throne. God put me on the throne. And he'll bless me. So let's look at it from the perspective, first of all, of the critic. And here's the thing that I, I learned from this, is that misinformation, we hear a lot about misinformation today, don't we? 
right? That everybody's talking about misinformation. And get, can you, can't, I just can't wait to get to September and October and November and election season. It's just going to be so you, you not unifying. Misinformation is simply misunderstood information. It's information that's not understood. And so what do we, when we're tempted to be the critic, need to do? We just need to ask some questions because Shimei had it all wrong. His information was wrong. David had not done those things. Not only that, Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, if you were here a few weeks ago, we talked a little bit about him, was eating at the king's table. He not only didn't take Jonathan's life, Jonathan was his best friend, and he was honoring Jonathan's son on behalf of Jonathan. See, we live in a world where it's often who's going to be the first one to get the tweet out. Who's going to be the first one to get that picture on Instagram? And it's real easy, if we're not careful, to not ask the questions. What's the truth? What's really going on here? Before we allow our hurt or our frustration to be put out on social media as a critic, or before we talk to a family member or somebody, whoever it is, we're, we're sensing a, a desire to critique. We just need to step back and ask, do I have all the facts? Because we live in a world that just doesn't happen today, right? You hear about something and everybody goes on X and tells what they think their opinion is about it. They hear about something going on at, in this governmental agency or in this church or in this business. And we all have opinions on it, but we don't all have information. And we don't realize the pain and the hurt that we're creating or that we're feeding. So we just need to ask the question, what is the truth? Now, what about if you're David? Because Shimei is the critic and David is the one being criticized. And this is hard. But notice that David embraces criticism's potential to reveal blind spots and to hold us accountable. See, criticism has the potential. I'm not saying it always does this, but it does have the potential to make us aware of something we might not normally see because it's a blind spot. And somebody else is capable of seeing it. And maybe they don't deal with it right. Maybe they don't handle it right. But it can awaken us to be used by us so, so that we can succeed at what we've been called to do. In other words, what the enemy means to destroy you might be the very thing that God can use in our lives to propel us into our destiny. See, not every criticism is from the devil. Could God be using even your critic to reveal a truth that you and I need to know? See, how I feel about criticism, because it never feels good, does it? I mean, I, I just, it's just never. Some people are better at taking criticism. Some of us are not very good at taking criticism. But how I feel about it, it only lasts a moment, but how I respond to it can last a lifetime, and it does in these two men's lives. And, and, and so I need that take a, a moment to say, is there something I need to see in this? And, and I've shared with you guys before, I, you can't listen to everybody because then you'll listen to nobody because you'll become so wounded and so numb and so hurt and so hard. And so I decided that I want to listen to those, first of all, who loved me. I consider potential church, those of you who are a part of this family, as people who love me. And when you're faithful to this house, if there's some criticism, I want to ask the question, is there something you see that I don't see that can help me become who God wants me to be? I want to listen to those who love me, to those who believe in me. They see God's hand upon my life and those who know more than me. And so with David and Shemi, we see the plot. But then we see in the very next verse the conflict between these two men. Look what happens in verse 13. It says, so David and his men continued down the road. And Shimei kept pace with them on a nearby hillside, cursing and throwing stones and dirt at David. I mean, he just keep, he's not going to let go. He not only did it when he saw David, he not only threw a few dirt clods. Man, he's just going to continue on down the road. The king and all who were with him grew weary along the way, and 
They rested when they reached the Jordan River. So what can we learn from Shimei the critic? Well, he needs to stop walking and ask the question, what's the outcome he's after? See, often our criticism is carried by our emotions. We get angry, we get envious, we get frustrated, and then as a result, we become critics. And when we see ourselves passionately just always being critical, we might want to step back and ask, well, what am I really after? What, what, what's the outcome that I want to see accomplish? See, for Shimei, his life had become about revenge for his family. And revenge is not our responsibility. It wasn't Shimei's and it's not yours. Right? God takes care of revenge. God takes care of justice. It's not my responsibility to make sure you pay for the things that you've you've done. I kind of think of it like this. I don't know if you watch much football. I'm more of a basketball fan, but we may throw the flag, right? We may see as somebody's life, hey, there's something that shouldn't have happened. Here's the flag on the play. But God assesses the penalty, not you and me. And Shimei is spending his life trying to get back revenge. And often our rocking chair criticism is the result of either trying to get revenge for pain that we feel or envy that we feel. It's not fair. Did you see what that person was wearing? Did you see where they went on vacation? Did you see how he treated his wife? Did you see what kind of parents they had? Did you see what kind of employer they had? Did you see what their church did? Did you see, right? All of that driven by envy then to go on whether it be in the coffee shop or on social media, and for you and I to become critics. And here's why it's so dangerous. is because criticism will do something to your own heart. It changes us from the inside. And it's very easy to go from being the criticized to being the critic. To becoming that angry person. See, Jesus says our mission is something different. Remember the story in the New Testament when the woman was caught in adultery. She was guilty. She did it. But remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, hey, those of you without sin, throw the first stone. In other words, Jesus said, our mission is to partner with people so they can be what God has called them to be. It's not to judge people. It's to partner with people. And so any critique I might give or any critique you might give doesn't need to be driven out of revenge. It doesn't need to be driven out of envy. It needs to be motivated out of my desire to truly see you succeed. And if I do it for any other reason, I'm being transformed on the inside into something that's much more dark. What do we learn from David? Well, while we learn from Shimei, the critic, he needs to stop and ask the question, What's my real motivation? What am I really, outcome am I looking for? David, the criticized, well, he does just the opposite. He keeps walking down the road. It says, so David and his men continued down the road. See, Shimei needed to stop and ask, well, David needed to keep going. The temptation is to allow criticism to discourage us to the point of giving up. You and I can get so busy defending ourselves, we forget where we're going. Right? There is always going to be critics. If you decide you're going to get married, somebody's going to tell you, well, you waited too long. Somebody else is going to say, you got married way too early. You got married way too young. Got married way too old. Why did you move there? You ever get criticized for where you decided to move or to live? I know when Steph and I moved to South Florida, it was like, you're going where? From Arkansas to Miami? People die there. If you decide to have children, people are going to criticize it. You had them too early in your marriage. You had them too late in your marriage. Well, you only had one. That child's going to be lonely. You had 10. You must not care about the environment, right? There's always going to be criticism. I remember when I first got into ministry at this country church, Mount Zion. I've only been at three churches. The first one, first one was Mount Zion Baptist Church. And they decided to have a business meeting. 
And I knew it wasn't going to be a good business meeting. So I told Steph, I said, don't even come. You just stay home. And they decided, and I was probably, I don't know, 22, 23 at the time. And they, I stood, you know, we had one of those big old plat, or podium things, you know. And I'm standing there, and they just kind of took turns standing up and saying what they didn't like about my leadership. I mean, I'd only been there, I don't know, eight months or something like that. It's the first time I'd ever pastored anything. I'm sure I made lots of different mistakes along the way. But the church had grown and they had become critics. And it so wounded my soul that I had nightmares for years after that. Because criticism has a price. I remember at our campus in Pensacola one time after the service, you know, I'm kind of greeting folks and uh, a couple ladies come up and they see my tattoos. I don't know what you think about my tattoos. I like them. But they said... Uh, they said, now I'm sure you got those tattoos before you became a Christian, didn't you? <laughs> and I said, well, just don't go online and look, okay? <laughs> Every weekend, there are tons of critics when it comes to te our teaching. Like, this is that, and that is that. And just like you, there's always going to be critics. And here's the thing you got to realize. Criticism has an impact on you and the people around you. There are no super people here. We all like to pretend it doesn't bother me. I've learned to deal with it. And yes, we do have to learn to deal with it. But notice what the text says. It says that they got tired and so they sat down to rest. It even affected Jesus. Remember in John chapter 6, Jesus is talking about vision, about where they're going to go and what they're going to do. And he says, hey, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to lay down your life. You're going to have to pick up your cross. You're going to have to drink my blood. You're going to have to eat my flesh. And they're like, "Woo, Jesus, that's a little too tough. I think you're asking for a little too much. And it says they walked away. So many people left that Jesus looked at his closest followers, his boys. He says, you guys going to leave too? In other words, the criticism of the group impacted even Christ himself in his humanity. It will impact you. And if you're not aware of that, it can destroy you. It's exhausting. It's tiring. And you have to make sure that you are mentally, spiritually, and emotionally healthy so that you can pursue the purpose and the destiny for which God has created you. See, some of us have never experienced the success that God truly wants us to experience in our lives because we're not emotionally prepared for it. Because it's going to come with criticism. It's going to come with people saying things that are not true. Things that come against your reputation and your family, all those things are going to happen. And if you and I aren't ready for those things, then those very things can be the things that push us to become <laughs> rocking chair critics ourselves. You see them, right? People who are negative about everything. They're negative about life. They're negative about the future. They're negative about the church. They're negative about the world. They just, they've given up on greatness. And they're just, and it's not because they're evil, it's because they were unprepared for the enemy's attack on our pursuit of the greatness for which God created us. So it's important that when we look at the story that we are just reminded that, that criticism does have an impact and that you and I need to keep going. I'm just going to keep going. I'm just going to keep walking towards what God has called me to do, doing the best that I can, looking around and making sure that I'm not missing any blind spots, that there's not something that I can learn. And then in our story, we have a, like every good story, we have a plot twist. Absalom is defeated. You know, the Bible says about Absalom, it says he was the best looking dude in town. And it said he had beautiful hair. But then his hair gets stuck in a tree. <laughs> Crazy, right? And he's hanging there and he ends up losing his life. It's over. And so David now is on his way back to the palace. He's on his way back to the throne. 
to Jerusalem. And who do you think is the first one to meet him? Shimei. Look what it says. It says, my Lord, the king, please forgive me, he pleaded. This is Shimei, the same dude who criticized, who cursed, who threw rocks, who blamed for 25, the 25 years of his life, everything was blamed on David. It's so, so be careful. It's so easy for you and I to step into being the victim or the victimized. It doesn't mean that bad things don't happen in this world. But you have to remember, you are a child of the king. And there is nobody that can keep you from your destiny. And so I don't know Shimei's motivation, but he said, hey, David, forgive me. Forget the terrible thing your servant did when you left. May the king put it out of his mind. You know how much I sin. That is why I have come here today, the very first person of all of Israel, to greet you, the king. Now, his boys, David's, you know, traveling team, said um, they're not going to fall for this. Right? Look at what it says. <laughs> they just say, Shimei should die. And don't fall for it, David. This is your opportunity Take him out because he's cursed the Lord's anointed. And then I love, David says the same thing he said earlier. Who asked for your opinion? I, I just think that's so funny. Who, who asked for your opinion? Why have you become my adversary today? This is not a day for execution. For today I am once again the king of Israel. Then turning to Shimei, David's vowed, your life will be spared. And so what do we learn from the critic? What do we learn from Shimei? Well, with humility... We have to be willing to apologize because you're going to get it wrong sometimes. Even maybe when your motive of critique, you truly are trying to help somebody succeed. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's someone you're doing ministry with. Maybe it's a pastor, maybe, whoever it is, but you're going to get it wrong. It's okay to apologize. And when you do, make it real. Let's just practice. All right? You, you, you ready? We're going to say, I'm sorry. I, oh, 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 oh. Got to get our mouths ready. I, I, when I was a kid, there was this show called Happy Days, and there was this dude called Fonzie, and he could never get it out. He couldn't say, I'm sorry. So take a deep breath. You ready? You might even want to look at somebody, because maybe something happened this morning that none of us know about, but here we go. You ready? I'm sorry. One more time. I'm, I'm sorry. And, and here's the thing. When we apologize, we need to make it real. Because if we're not careful, we'll say what? We'll say, I never intended on hurting you. Okay? Now, that's okay. But here's what you have to be careful of doing. Because if we're not careful when we say, I'm so sorry, I never intended on hurting you. You know what the person you're apologizing can often hear is... I'm in the only idiot in the world that took what you said the wrong way, right? It's very easy for our apology to be a condemnation. I'm sorry, I never intended it, so you must be stupid to think that that's what I actually meant. And so we have to be really careful. Hey, I'm sorry, and then I've got to own the fact that I miscommunicated. It's not that you didn't understand, it's that I can do better right? A real apology. But then I think it's important to ask ourselves the deeper question. Why did I get this wrong? Because the goal at the end of the day is to what? It's to succeed. It's to become what God created us to be. It's to reach our destiny, to live our potential. And to do that, we got to do things other people are unwilling to do, which is to ask the difficult question. Not only did I get it wrong, and not only am I going to apologize to you, but why did I get it wrong? Why was I so quick to jump on the bandwagon? And, and I, I see this a lot of times, you know, because we live in a social media world where if somebody stubs their toe on the other side of the world, we all know it. So it's hard to know what happens more and what doesn't. But when a pastor screws up, and I might be talking to another pastor or something, and that pastor will look and they'll say, I'll tell you what, I am so sick of pastors screwing up. It's like, I, that, it's sad. 
It's heartbreaking when that happens. And, and then they'll say something to the effect, and I'll tell you what, nobody in my family's ever going to have to apologize for me because I will never do that. I think that's a dangerous stance to take. See, our desire is always, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to make that mistake, right? But our heart has to be, but I'm human, and I could. Because here's the thing. Once you determine you will never do something, you will put yourself into position that makes it really dangerous. See, if you have determined you will never have an affair, you will do things that make it easier for you to have an affair. Because you could never have an affair. So you can go... See, but if you ask the question, the deeper question, why did I do this? Or why did this person? What was going on? How? Then that may mean you have to change some things. It may mean you have to change the movies you go to or the shows that you watch or what you listen to or what you read if we are really serious about not making the same mistakes. But the moment you, it's kind of like you decide, you know what, I will never cheat on my diet. Right? Have you ever done? I just will never cheat. I am sick of being sick. Now, a person who makes that kind of statement, somebody will say, oh, I'm sorry, I, I brought my brownies. Don't worry about it. I have this, I'm never going to cheat. Well, that's until you're tired and you're sick and you haven't lost any weight. Instead of people saying, oh, you look good, they ask you, you put on weight. <laughs> well, if they think I have, I might as well go ahead, right? Because the brownies are right there. Because you've told everybody don't worry about it because you're never going to cheat. But see, if humbly you realize that you're just human and you can cheat, therefore the brownies won't be there when you're frustrated because you'll be making decisions to protect yourselves from those. So I just encourage us to be careful with humility be willing to apologize and to learn. And what about the criticized, David? Maybe this is even just as difficult. With humility, be willing to forgive. And it's important. We're not forgiving because they deserve forgiveness. I, I don't know if Shimei deserved forgiveness. I don't know if he's just trying to preserve his own life. I don't know if he's mocking David. I can tell you this in my life. I've had folks, I know this is hard to believe, but there have been people who have left potential church. And some of them leave frustrated and angry. Sometimes it's even people in, on the ministry team. And, and I've had several calls where they will apologize. And sometimes, to be honest, it seems to me that the only reason they're apologizing is so they can say they apologize. In other words, they want a clean record when they go for another job interview or something. They're not really apologizing. They just want to be able to say that they apologized. And at other times, I've had people who really apologize. In other words, they, they see what happened and they see, and they're really sorry. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter which one they are. I am to forgive both of them. Because without forgiveness, something happens to my heart. And I don't know if Shimei was true and on. I, the Bible doesn't tell us. But what I do know is it doesn't matter. Because with humility, it's not about winning. It's not even about being right. It is about releasing. Right? Releasing them from our mind and from our heart. Letting them go. I may not invite that person back into my life if I don't know, you know, what their motive is. But I'm going to release them from my mind and from my heart. Now, here's the tragedy of our story. Neither one of these guys learned the lesson. Neither one of them. David nor Shimei. I, I want to reverse the order. And instead of looking at the critic first, I want us to look at the criticized David. The end of his life. He's on his deathbed. And he's talking to his son, Solomon. And who do you think's on his mind? I mean, there's so much, right? David was passionate about building the temple. Solomon was about to take over the throne. I mean, there's a lot going on in the world. But who do you think is on David's mind 
Well, it tells us in 1 Kings chapter 2. He says, and remember Shimei. Remember him, Solomon, the son of Gera? Remember, he cursed me with a terrible curse. And you remember, when he came to meet me down there, I know, Solomon, what you're thinking. When he came to meet me at the Jordan River, I swore by the Lord that I would not kill him. But that oath does not make him innocent. And you know what, son? You're a wise man. And you will know how to arrange a bloody death for him. Is that not crazy? And the very next verse, David died. The last thing on his mind is that Shimei took up residence in his mind and it was simply because he dared criticize him. Now the Bible doesn't tell us if Shimei did, you know, over the, from the time he apologized until this time, if he did anything else wrong or any of those kind of things. And we know it was simply because Shimei criticized him because Mephibosheth ate at his table. It wasn't that David was afraid that one of Saul's family members would take over the throne because Mephibosheth had a lot more right to the throne than Shimei did. Because he criticized him. And while his words said, I forgive, his mind and his heart never did. Grows into something ugly and bitter. And not only does it affect David, but now it's got to affect his son because he gives it to him. And we see that happen all the time, don't we? See the way people feel about Christianity or church or political parties or whatever because it's been handed down to them because of the way somebody was treated in the generation before them. And now they're carrying around an anger and a bitterness, a bitterness and a sense of some kind of revenge over something in reality that has nothing to do with them. See, David struggled to let go. He passed it down. You know, there's something you learn when you read the scripture. God created you intentionally. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about how before you were visible, you were invisible in the mind of God. God intentionally created you. Therefore, we have to live intentionally. We can't just get up and walk around every day because you have an adversary. And the Bible says he's like a roaring lion. He's going to and fro. He's looking for an opportunity, according to Jesus, to still kill and destroy. He wants to take you out, your family out, your dreams out, your finances out, your health out. And so we have to live intentionally. We have to realize that we have to apologize and that we need to forgive because those are the things that allow us to truly have a successful life. So Solomon allows him to live. He doesn't just get a bloody death for him. He says, okay, you can live in Jerusalem, but don't leave. Let's read about it. 2 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 2. This king sent for Shimei and told him, this king is not David, but it's Solomon, his son. He says, build a house here in Jerusalem and live there, but don't step outside the city to go anywhere else. On that day, if you even cross the Kidron River, you're going to die, bro, and that blood will be on your own head. And Shimei, look at Shimei's response. Your sentence is fair, and I'll do whatever my Lord King commands. Hey, this is great. This is fine. I understand. I'm with you. Seems as maybe even his apology was real. Maybe that David was carrying this around when he shouldn't have. It was destructive. It says, so Shimei lived in Jerusalem for a long time. How long? Well, three years. And then two of his slaves run away. And when Shimei learned where they were, he sent a text to Solomon. To let him know what was up. No, no. What did he do? He saddled his donkey and he goes and gets what he thinks is his own property. And when he gets them, he brings them back. In other words, he hasn't learned anything. He's still being controlled by his emotions. It must be right, right? I've been wrong. He's just being motivated as so many critics are. He stood on the hill throwing rocks at David. Not because he knew the truth, but because of what he felt passionately in his heart he was driven by his passions and here again we see him just being driven by his passions and as a result it's going to cost him his life and often the 
The one who's being criticized struggled to let it go. David struggled to let it go. While the critic, Shimei, struggled to gain control. Often people live from one offense to the other. Just completely out of control. Always angry, always frustrated, always... You may know someone like that. But the New Testament gives us an appeal for what could have been an alternate ending. Because in the book of Philippians, Paul's writing to the church at Philippi, and he's got two ladies who are frustrated with each other. And look at what he says to them. He says, I appeal um, to Yodia and however you say, Sinichi, all right, however you say that name. He says, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. Because see, here's the thing, guys, we're going to have disagreements. If you do life for any length of time with other people, you're different people. And disagreements are actually opportunities for greater intimacy. He says, rather than becoming rocking chair critics, rather than throwing rocks at one another, settle your disagreement. How? Well, he tells them because, you know, you've, you've made an impact. Your life, don't throw away your legacy over this disagreement by the way you respond. Don't allow a critic to cause you to lose your reputation. So how do we do that? He says, well, celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in him. In other words, take your focus off yourself. Take your focus off your critic. Take your focus off the criticism and just focus on the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere at one time God who spoke the world into existence, who is the great physician in all of our lives. Revel on Him. Focus on Him. Rejoice in Him. And then he says, make it clear. Make it as clear as you can to all that you meet. You're on their side. You're working with them. You're not against them. Your goal is not envy. Your goal is not revenge. That our desire is to partner. Don't worry about anything, right? Don't worry about the critics. Don't worry about the criticism. Instead, do what? Tell God. Talk to God. Pray to God. Tell God what you need. Thank him for what he has done. And then here's what we all want, right? You'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. There's no greater maybe testimony than being faithful as you walk through criticism pursuing the destiny for which you were created. Would you bow your head? With your head bowed and your eyes closed. Maybe there's some of us who have never experienced the peace of God. I invite you to do that today. Maybe you've allowed the criticisms of others. Maybe you've even carried the the bitterness of a mom or a dad and brought it into your own life towards God. And more than anything, you just desire his peace. Well, you can have it. <laughs> That's the great thing about what I get the opportunity to do is just to make it available to everybody. He didn't come with a pointed finger, but he came with open arms. The Bible says that whosoever calls will receive peace, salvation, transformation, forgiveness. So just ask him right there where you're sitting, if you're watching online, if you're over in Lima, wherever you might be, say, God, I, I desire your peace. I want your 
peace. I need your peace. Forgive me. <laughs> I've been trying to con convince others by defending myself. I've been, I've been doing a lot of things, but none of them have led to peace. I, I need your peace. Forgive me for doing it my way. I'm committing to doing it yours. Father, I thank you for the story, the reminder that we will all have critics. The price of progress, the price of purpose and destiny and potential is that we will always walk by those rocking chair critics. But I pray that we would continue to progress toward our calling, our destiny, our purpose, with peace, with joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.